Hi everybody, my name is Richard Santoro and I welcome you to Third and Zen, the YouTube channel where every week we are sharing a spiritual message to nourish ourselves, heart, mind, body, and soul. First, I want to thank you for stopping by the channel. I want to thank you for checking out today's video. I hope this video and this moment finds you doing well. I hope you're enjoying your spring and the sunshine and the allergies aren't killing you too much. And I hope if you have things going on in your life, in your immediate life or with all the things going on in the world around us, that you're taking the time to care for yourself, to nourish yourself, to tend to yourself, heart, mind, body, and soul. And I hope we're all taking the time to care for one another. We're all in this together. So again, thanks for stopping by the channel. Hope you're doing well. If you do feel like liking the video, subscribing to the channel, sharing the video, that would be more than uh, appreciated. Helps get the word out. So let's get right into what we're doing today. We are doing something that I haven't done on this channel yet, uh, but I'm very excited about it. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you appreciate what we're doing today. Uh, let's talk about what we're doing and then we'll get into it. Um, art. Art is a huge part of my life, has been for years now. Um, it's, it was a big part of my studies. It's a big part of my ministry. It's a big part of my joy overall, my spiritual, emotional, mental, physical joy. I love art. And one thing I did do in my ministry in church was I'd gather us on a Sunday, on a Saturday, we'd meet down at the church and we would, I, I would have printed out pieces of famous art or maybe not even famous art sometimes, uh, as we'll see today, to show us. And we would talk about it. And it, we would examine the art itself, art for art's sake, look at the technical aspects and just break it down a little bit. And we would talk about the story that was being depicted. We would talk about the individuals that were being depicted, you know, themes. A lot of times when I'd have these discussions, it would be centered on a particular theme, each of the pieces. Today, there's not going to be a theme, but we would basically be having a really cool, lively, soulful discussion about the art. What, what moved us? What we see? Do we like it? Don't we like it? Are we having an emotional response to it, whether it's liking it, loving it, or not? So that's what we're going to do today. Obviously, we can't engage, but we're going to go over some pieces of art. And particularly when they're pieces of art that depict Bible stories, it's a really, really great tool to help make the story itself come to life and allow us to find a new and unique and different approach, it really does lend itself to a whole new way of coming at a story. And we'll see that today with some of the pieces. The pieces that we're going to discuss today, which will be listed down below, don't worry, um, but the pieces that we're going to, not all of them are going to be depicting a Bible story, as we'll see, but the ones that do, it helps us learn about the story and find sometimes new fruit from the story. So that's what we're doing today. That's today's message. We're going to look at art. We're going to talk about it. We're going to find fruit from it. And that's it. Now, there's a few things I want to say, a few disclaimers, a few introductory things. First is really, really, really important. Um, there will be some images of Jesus. But going forward, when we do do this, when I do these kind of videos... There will be some images of Jesus, and I'm going to mention this sometimes. I am really, really mindful, and I care very much about the whitewashing of Jesus in Western art through the centuries. We have to remember that in Western civilization, um, the Christian church, particularly the Roman Catholic church, was the predominant power, Western Europe. And therefore, a lot of the images most if not all of the images of that time of the Middle Ages on through all that the art you know what I'm talking about depicted Jesus in a very whitewashed way when I say that I mean as a white man as a as a white anglo-saxon European man when we know that Jesus is is from the Middle East and it it did lend itself it did help over the centuries to lead to an image of Jesus that was whitewashed, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to ignore these images of Jesus. We are still going to talk about them, but with the background caveat that, yeah, this is a thing that we need to be mindful of that happened. It's a conversation and a topic in and of itself, but I'm not someone that ignores it and isn't mindful of it. 
and yet at the same time holding space for, all right, here's the conversation about that. We'll care for that. We'll be mindful of that in history and how it's lent itself through the years in our mental Western society depiction of Jesus, an idea of Jesus. But at the same time, while we care for that, we also hold space for, all right, now let's, let's look at the actual art. Let's look at the piece. Let's talk about that. Um, so I just need to throw that out there. So that's number one. Okay, moving on from that, like I said, I'm going to post the names, the, the pieces, the information I have on, on the pieces, what I can post. Some of them, you know, I don't know where they're located now. Some of them I don't have the size and dimension. So not all the piece information will have all the same details. Some have, you know, the title of the piece, the artist, the size of the piece, which can be really important, where the piece is currently located. Some will be missing some of that. So I just want to mention that. Okay, so we're going to get started in just a moment. I want you to take a breath. I want you to take a moment. I want you to get yourself still, get yourself in a place. And before I give real good instruction to get us into that space, um, I want to apologize in advance for, for uh, the technical aspect of this. You know, YouTube people that are better equipped mentally or technology-wise would have the image, you know, appear on the screen. I won't. So instead of digital, it's going to be analog. I'm going to be actually showing you the piece. So, you know, a copy, printed out copy of the piece. So apologies in advance if it's not as technically advanced as some. Like I said, it's going to be analog, not digital, so to speak. Okay, now some specific instruction, and I will do my best to not shake the desk, okay? But that's probably going to happen. Some instruction for this. And I want you to trust me on this. Okay. This is going to, this is, uh, this whole exercise, I ask for a little bit of trust going forward. Um, and one thing I'm going to ask you to trust me on is there's two ways we approach our approach to art. We have to, we, we would be really, it would be very beneficial whenever we see art to be real or anything in life to be really, really mindful and cognizant and aware of our initial reaction, our gut reaction. I'm going to talk about that with a few of these pieces, but our initial reaction to things in life, really important, really valuable. You know, how our, how our internal makeup responds to it. So that's my instructional gift to you. Be aware of that as I show a piece that you're seeing for the first time. How does it hit you? How does it land? And then, of course, like all things in life, there is the gut initial response, but then there's also the, okay, let's settle. What's reflecting? What's landing for me? What am I noticing that I didn't notice? And we'll talk about the things that we notice. So there are two different times of different types of reactions, but both with really cool essential value. So be mindful of the gut reaction. When we would do this, when I would do this with people together, it was always so much fun. I would really, really be strict with people in a loving way, but no looking ahead, because I'd hand out these pieces of paper. No looking ahead. I want us to all see it for the first time together. I didn't want people to look ahead and look at it, because I want people to be mindful of that initial response. So with that being said, let's get started, and I'm going to hope that technically this works out well, and you can see, and we'll talk about it. So this first one, I'm going to show it to you, and then we'll talk, and I'll give you the name and the information all. So take this in, just soak that in for a moment. I love this piece. What you're gonna hear, you're gonna see a very passionate, very energetic side of me. But again, I'll try not to shake the table. Okay, this is a, so you're mentally soaking this in, you're visually soaking this in. This is a, um, a piece by a contemporary artist, somebody that's painting today named Daniel Bonnell. Again, the information will be posted down below. And maybe you're wondering who this is, what this is. And that's good. That's good to do because maybe you're seeing it and thinking it's one story in, or two certain individuals, but it's actually in reality others. So that's cool. Um, this is called The Woman at the Well. The Woman at the Well. And this is a depiction of a biblical story from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, chapter 5. I forget because um, it's, it's right there next to the Nicodemus chapter. The author always juxtaposes a man and a woman. Men are knuckleheads. The women seem to get it for that author. Um, but this is from John's Gospel. Now, I did, in our last week's message, talk about the Good Samaritan, and I referenced Samaritans. In this story, okay, 
This Samaritan woman goes to the well every day at around noon. And that tells us a lot in the, in the historical context. What that lets us know is she's going to the well at the hottest part of the day when people don't go to the well. You go when it's cooler. Like people that live in Florida, you don't mow your lawn at one o'clock in the afternoon when it's blazing hot. People in Florida do it earlier, much earlier when it's cooler. But the fact that she goes at an undesirable part of the day means she's an outcast. And then we see in the dialogue that Jesus has with her about her marital relationships, why she's a social outcast and a pariah. So that's what we know about her. So that's number one. Number two, Jesus is, t and we're going to talk about the peace, but I want to give it context for the story. So Jesus goes to this area. He's by himself. The disciples go off to do some stuff, shop for groceries, whatever. And Jesus meets this woman at this well at the hottest part of the day. Now, number one, he talks to her. He should, that's taboo. That's against, you know, the, the Hebrew law because a Jewish man shouldn't be talking to a, a Samaritan woman. Jewish individual doesn't, you know, engage a Samaritan woman. A man doesn't engage a Samaritan woman. A rabbi, not a rabbi by today's standards, like clergy, a rabbi meaning a teacher, wouldn't engage a woman alone. A rabbi wouldn't engage a Samaritan woman alone. So there's so many taboos, and plus this woman's an outcast, so that right there, there's so many taboos that Jesus is breaking. And it, it, it's addressed in the exchange that Jesus has with her. She addresses it. Why are you, you know, what are you talking to me for? But they talk. They talk. Jesus engages her. And as is um, thematic and normal of John's gospel, when somebody engages Jesus, it leads to deeper truths revealed from Jesus. And this is one of those moments you know, I, he, Jesus talks about himself being the living water. And it's a really awesome moment. All right, let's talk about the piece. Now that, um, and don't worry, every piece I won't be giving a complete, you know, Bible study lesson on it, but it's important for this one. Okay, so you had time to hear me put the story in context and also visually intake the image. I love this image so much. Now, I talked about the whitewashing of Jesus. This image doesn't do that. For one, it blurs Jesus out, which is kind of cool because when there's no face there for us to have an exact, you know, iPhone picture of his face like you see my face, but blurry, we can bring certain things to it. There's an ambiguity there that's cool. Now, we're going to see in some other pieces. Now, normally in images, like look at this. This is an engraving that my Uncle Mike made when he was younger. Kind of thing you do in shop. Notice how the praying hands are in the center. Calvin and Hobbes. Notice how Calvin and Hobbes are situated in the center. The wonderful Bill Waterston creating that. That's actually from one of the Sunday comics, right in the center. And you will often see that in art, right in the center. But no, no, this one, Jesus is off to one side. She's off to one side. But what the artist does do, something that happens a lot in art, notice this, triangle. Our brains and our visual intake takes in a triangle shape in a more palatable way. We digest and process that visually. So the artist is giving Jesus in a triangle shape. And what that also does, that, look, it leads right to her. It, it, there's a space, but it's a light. Read whatever you want into that. Now, Jesus isn't passing. If I look at this and, I th and somebody says, asks, do you think Jesus is passing judgment on this person? I'm going to say no. His body language is, is one of not lecturing, but one of, here, bear with me, but hmm, contemplative. Hmm. You know, it's not arms folded. It's not, it's not, it's, hmm, it's very peaceful, very triangular. Okay, so let's get back to the actual piece. So I like that about Jesus. And I like that it's void of color. It doesn't, it's not darkened in the, in the way we think of dark and brooding, but just there, if that makes sense. And she's almost leaning in. She's a little pensive, a little, you read what you want into that emotion. We see the sun in the background. But I just like this exchange. They're not facing each other, but she is facing him. And he's sort of he's sort of open there. 
and I just really like this. Part of the reason why I like this is also the story that's being depicted. You would have no problem finding crucifixion art and Last Supper art and nativity art and other really foundational stories, transfiguration art and, and in Jesus in the garden art. It's these not obscure stories, because this isn't obscure, but it's the, you know, not huge stories that we see over and over. I mean, how many bat? I love Batman. You know, you might have noticed times, you know, uh, stuffs. And, but we have a lot of Batman movies. We have a lot of Spider-Man movies. You know, we have a lot of crucifixion art. We have a lot of nativity art. We don't have a lot of woman at the well art, and it's a great story. And this is a lovely, wonderful depiction by Daniel Bonnell. It's a depiction of Jesus doing something really taboo, breaking social norms, which is what he did a lot, to show love to this woman. And the story of where she goes and how it affects her and the community after is really cool. So check out John's Gospel, either chapter 4 or chapter 5, you'll see in the heading. But I just really love the, the depiction of Jesus. He's not at the center, but he does sort of command the scene, but in a not passive way, but in a zen, cool, calm, peaceful way. And I love that. I just love this one. This is one of those that when I first saw, I was like, oh, wow, this is cool. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about this one. Again, this is uh, The Woman at the Well by Daniel Bonnell. Again, I'll have the information listed down below. I don't know where this is located. Actually, you could even find that on like those websites that um, where you can buy prints and copies and hopefully uh, the artist is affiliated with those websites and some of it can go to that and you know to Daniel himself okay let's move on to the next one take a breath clear your mental palate I, I remember they used to make fun of me in our discussion groups and be like this is like a little sorbet a little cleansing of the palate um, so take a moment just get yourself ready for the next piece and this one okay okay soak that in be mindful of your initial reaction to it how do you like it how does it make you feel how did the other one did you like it didn't like it how do you like this we don't have to like every piece we can appreciate them or we cannot we can love them or we cannot it's okay there's no judgment here in how we feel or respond to these non-judgmental observers but if you love it, that's awesome. Okay, uh, where the previous one was a contemporary artist, this is from 1890, a Spanish artist um, named Enrique Simonet. Enrique Simonet, if I'm mispronouncing that or not doing a good job, I apologize. And it's entitled simply, Head of Jesus. You might have guessed this is Jesus. Okay, now it is an unfinished piece. I had a hard time finding what the story was with this one. Is it unfinished on purpose? Is it a sketch for a larger piece that I am not aware of that piece existing? I couldn't find that. I don't know. But I love this nonetheless. And this is what we have. So again, a little bit like the previous piece where the face is blurred out. The face isn't really whitewashed, to be honest with you. I like that. I like that it's a little bit of a different image. It's a little, it's not too unorthodox, which being unorthodox is great, especially in art and especially in religious and spiritual art. I love that. Um, but it's not too far off the beaten path. I like that it's unfinished. Now let's talk a little bit about it. We do have Jesus in the center. Jesus is it. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. We don't know when this is happening. Now maybe you can look at this and think, I bet this is happening in this moment. And that's cool. That's you bringing something to the piece. That's you having a mental and emotional and spiritual response to that. But we don't know. What we do know, I mean, look at his face. Look at his expression. Let me hold that a little closer. Look how it's, it's, it's pensive. It's thoughtful. He's not engaging in dialogue. He's not acting. He's not doing something. He might be between sentences. He might be between doing something and action. But either way... It's a snapshot of a pensive look of Jesus. Now, the cool thing about it being unfinished, and if this is intentional, and I like to think that this is, that's my approach to it. 
look at the look at the difference. We got the gray around, and we got the light down there. Artist signature, but you got it's light here. It's light here, and we see this a lot in art. We will see the traditional halo, sometimes subtle, sometimes really there, sometimes looking like a you know golden platter that you serve something on behind them, you know, in that Byzantine art way back when. But when it's just subtle, when it's a light difference, when the artist is doing a difference in shading to show that that's cool, I like to think that's intentional. I don't know, but it happens quite a bit. We do have the triangular shape. Again, very common, not, probably not by mistake. But overall, I like that it's unfinished. I like that it takes up the entire entirety of the piece. I don't know how big this one is. I don't know how big the Daniel Bono one was we just looked at. But I just like this depiction of Jesus. It lands for me. And I'm not going to take up a bunch more time talking about it. So just soak that in. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one. Okay. Um, we have had... Two depictions of Jesus thus far, one depicting a traditional biblical story, and one just depicting Jesus. Now we're going to look at another image, okay? Um, going to look at, a, it's a couple of images of something, all right? So bear with me one second, let's get this uh, all ready. Okay, take a moment, and here's what we have here, Okay. Okay, now take a look. I'm going to try to cover that title that's down there. Maybe you saw it. But take a look. This is a sculpture. This is a sculpture. What do you see? What does that look like to you? Soak it in. Get an idea. Now, I might have maybe gave a little bit too much away to give you an idea of who this is and what's being depicted here. Um, this is by a, a current artist, sculpture artist, who's really great, named, named Timothy Schmalz. He's got a Facebook page. You can check him out. He's really, really wonderful. And he, he has a piece, actually, that was accepted by the Vatican, uh, which is really cool. This is called Jesus the Homeless. Jesus the Homeless. And this is Jesus himself. Okay? And he... Um, he sells these pieces, oftentimes to churches or to parks, and it can be, it's actually been a little controversial in some places because it's not the Reverend Jesus. It's not the iconic, the icon, um, and I mean that in a religious way, um, depiction of Jesus, the worshipful depiction of Jesus. It's this. And the title of this one is The Least of These. No, I'm sorry. This is Jesus the Homeless. Soak that in. I'm going to turn this over. And this one, same. Same artist, Timothy Schmalz. This is called The Least of These. Now, let's see if we can get up close. If you can see here, it's got the nail marks, the stigmata in those to show that it's Jesus. Now, this isn't depicting the, you know, the glorified Jesus. This is the title, in case... The, the author didn't do it by mistake. The least of these is Matthew 25, 40. Whatever you do to the least of these, whatever you do to the least of mine, as some translations say, or the least of my brothers and sisters, you do to me. You know, so it's saying the poor, Jesus, the homeless, the homeless, the hungry, the downtrodden, whatever you do to them, you do to me. I am them. And it's really wonderful. It really is. These are you know, some of the locations that, that these images have been at. And again, um, I think it's one of these two. I think it's the other one, Jesus the Homeless, a smaller bench version that was given to the Vatican. And what I like about these is it, it lands. It really does. It's, a, it's not a glorification of Jesus. It's a visual reminder of his teaching. And yes, while worshiping, while being reverent and glorifying and celebrating Jesus is has its place, obviously so does his teachings. So does the value of these. And I really like these. So we have three, four different depictions of Jesus. We have, you know, the woman at the well, and we have the head of Jesus, and now we have these sculptures. And they're all different, and they're all wonderful in their own way in addition to being paintings and sculptures. Two contemporary artists, one uh, from 1890. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on from these, okay? Because um, I do have a few more here. Okay, take a nice deep breath. We're going to pivot a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. Take a moment. Get yourself ready. Adjust your posture, maybe. And let's take a look at this one. Okay. Soak that in. Soak that in. Let that land for you. See what you notice. See how it makes you feel. Gauge your response. And then start to transition as you probably already have done instinctively without even trying to. What is this? What's being depicted right here? What am I looking at? What do I see? I'm just going to give you another second. This is a very famous painting. This is a masterpiece. This is one, the first time I saw it, I literally gasped. Literally gasped. This is by Rembrandt, the master, um, one of the masters. This is the story. The title is The Return of the Prodigal Son. Um, so it tells the visual story of one of the foundational stories of the Gospels. It comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15 of Luke's Gospel, the parable of the prodigal son. It's really a wonderful chapter, chapter 15. It's, it's three different things that are lost and then found. Um, and it culminates in this one, the parable of the prodigal son. Again, I gasped. So I'm not going to break down the entire parable, but bottom line, this man, we don't know where the mother is, which is really interesting. We'll talk about this. The mother's not mentioned. But this man... Um, has two sons, one who works really hard, one who is a party animal and wants his inheritance early, gets it, takes it, goes off, lives the high life, squanders it all, ends up living in um, pig feed squalor and just is broken and hits rock bottom and comes back home. And the older son who worked really hard is a little like, mm. and the father is like, we're going to throw a feast and embraces the sun and it's a beautiful wonderful story it really is and this is a tremendous depiction it really is so let's let's start to now that you have some basic concept context if you want to pause the video go read Luke chapter 15 go right ahead that's actually something that's pretty cool to do if you want um okay so let's look uh I apologize particularly with this one because it is a blurrier image it's it's blurrier in general um, it's, it's not a hyper-realistic, like an Andrew Wyeth type painting, but the printout's blurrier than the, than the masterpiece, I, which I've never seen. It's located in St. Petersburg, uh, in, in the Hermitage Museum in, in Moscow, Russia. It's a big piece. It's almost nine feet by almost seven feet. When you have something like this and there, there's huge canvases, it really hits. It really does. Um, William Barclay, who I might have referenced, a great Scottish Bible scholar, um, wrote a book just about this piece. So not just about the prodigal son, but about the piece as well. I have it on my bookshelf. Um, all right, so who's who? Who's who? Okay, so this is the father, as you probably have guessed. Notice the triangle formation. Notice the light. Again, it's not centered, but that's okay, because our eyes, when we look at this, and tell me if I'm wrong, automatically you're going to go here. It lets us know where it wants us to look because this is lighter than everything else. Okay, it's triangular. The, eye, the, the line of sight, everyone is saying, look here, look there, look here. A little bit of a blurrier image, but look here. Every, and it happens in art. They're all going to look and say, hey, that's where you should be looking right now. So between that and the triangular shape and the, the light, this is the lightest part of the piece. So that's the father, that's the son. The son in a more humble, penitent posture on his knees. You can't really see too well, but his hair is, is tattered and in patches. You can see his clothes tattered. You can see his, his shoes are worn, one, one's barefoot. So you can really see that he's hit rock bottom and he's coming home. Now, this was pointed out to me once. Um, I forget where I read it, but in the story... In the story, as I mentioned, we don't know where the mother is. I never noticed that, but somebody in our Bible study group years ago when we were reading the story pointed out to me. I'm like, I, I never realized that. I was loving when people can point stuff out. And then 
Rembrandt, who was a very religious man, painted more and more biblical stuff as he got older. And you can't really tell, but this hand is a little smaller and lighter and more feminine looking. And this hand is a little larger and more masculine looking. And that was Rembrandt's way of depicting two paternal figures, a masculine and a feminine, you know, a, a, a more mother and father. That was his way of having that both represented. And the father is, is engulfing the son. There's no hesitation. He's, he's bending over. He's, he's enveloping him. Enveloping him. He's bringing him in in a beautiful way. And it really is a lovely depiction of this story. It's, this is a, a classic, an absolute masterpiece. Again, um, who are these figures, you might ask? We don't know. Is one of them the son that wasn't thrilled about the whole situation? And there's a whole sermon and fruit to be had there in analyzing that son in addition to the prodigal son. But this is a wonderful depiction of a phenomenal foundational biblical story. I love this one. Um, I gasped. Again, like I said, the first time I ever saw it. Maybe you like it. Maybe you don't. Maybe it lands for you. Maybe it doesn't. This is Rembrandt, The Return of the Prodigal Son. It was painted in 1669. Okay, we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on. Okay, got a, I got a few more. I didn't, I, I didn't put too many on our plate because, um, as you have noticed, I can talk about these, and I didn't know how long I would talk about them. Just kind of winging it a little bit. So you know, looking at the time, it's been a little while. It's been a little while. All right, um, let's look at this one now. Now, I'm curious, when you look at this one, actually, you don't need to see me. When you look at this one, do you know what that is? Do you know what story this is depicting? Soak that in. Be mindful of your response. Do you know what this one is? Maybe it was given away by everything we just talked about by the with the previous one, but this is also a depiction of the prodigal son by Timothy Schmaltz, the individual, the sculpture artist that we looked at those pieces of Jesus from before. This one's different, and that's one of the things I love. I actually did a, a whole theme on that one, so comparing two different of the same individuals or story by different artists, Donatello's David and Michelangelo's David. So this is the same thing. This is the prodigal son, and I love this one. I love it differently than the other. This one, sculpture. So, but there's something really beautiful about the way that parent is loving that child. About that way, the way that head is meeting that head. The way the, the, the hands are clasping the face. That right there is, is about as wonderful a depiction of parental, familial, and just sincere love as we can see look at the way the the son's arm is going under the legs almost as if to not just put his head in in the lap but just to grab onto the legs like a child would you can see it there and you can see it's interesting um schmaltz clothes them the same way but that's okay it's not about what they're wearing it's a very stripped down it's about the emotion if anything most of the piece isn't even these two, it's this, which what I, that's part of the other thing that I love about this. The artist is really letting us know that, look, it's almost like they're one individual, the way they're connected, but they're one, this whole thing is one, technically, not technically, but really it's all one piece, all one piece of stone. And it's almost symbolic of they're all, they're one piece, they're unified. They're, they're one. I'm not separate from you. Ubuntu. I am because we are. This is one solid. It's a, one, it's a solid block. And part of why this, the unison of the father and son, is, is almost secondary to the, the foundation, the bedrock. This. It's just tying the, it all together to show we're one piece. We're one piece. It's a beautiful emotional depiction, different than Rembrandt's, obviously sculpture versus painting, obviously the details, all of it, but beautiful. I love it.
I really do love this. Um, gonna do one more. Gonna do one more piece, and then we'll end it on that. I actually had more pieces planned, but we will save them for the next time, provided folks want a next time with these. So take a moment, take a breath. This is gonna be our last one. And I think this might have been the first one I ever showed in one of these forums, these settings. Now, I'm going to show it, but I'm going to hide the title because it's printed on here. And I want you to just be mindful of how you react and wonder, what am I seeing? Who am I seeing? So, there we go. I'm trying very hard to not show what's down there. Ah! All right. So, what do you see? think that is? Who do you think that is? What Bible story, what moment in scripture is this? I remember I had a lot of guesses from a lot from people when I posted it online in advance of getting together to do this and then in the forum to look at it. The name of this is called Conscience Judas. Conscience Judas by a wonderful, wonderful Ukrainian artist from 1891, Nikolai Guy, the Eastern European artist, Ukraine, Russia, of the late 1800s, what they were doing, oh my goodness, it's not something that's on our um, Western art radar in terms of history, but oh my goodness, we're, I have some to look at what they were doing. So powerful and emotional. And this is it. All right, let me stop. Let me stop talking about that and, and start looking at this. This is the moment after Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Reminder that it was Judas who betrayed Jesus. Let the Jewish officials know where Jesus would be so that they could go and arrest him in the, in the dark of night. Because if they arrested him during the daytime, the crowds would have rioted. So they wanted to do this quietly, which is not the way to do it. At night, it goes against, I think, about 30 of their, their legal justice system laws. They broke a lot of them that night. And Judas is the one who sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, as Scripture says, and leads the uh, Jewish soldiers, the guards, to Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was with um, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus is arrested. And as we can see here, as we can see here, there's the, you know, we can see the light, the torches of Jesus being led away and leaving G Judas here. Now, again, art and pieces are sometimes split in half, which is really cool. Half is this, half is this. Subtle light, more light. Again, it's enveloped in darkness. This happens to take place uh, during the night. It would have been a full moon because it takes place during fa Passover, and Passover is connected to the lunar cycle, full moon. So there would have been some, you know, provided it wasn't a cloudy night, some some moonlight. So that's got some realism to it, which these Eastern European artists had some wonderful realism. And it just leaves this lone figure, this lone figure, wrapped up the body language. What I love, there's so many things I love about this. So many things. Number one, like I said, if we didn't know who this was, who would we think it was? The title, Conscience Judas. If it just said conscience, then who would we think it was? Okay, now that we know it's Judas, it's a wonderful reminder that Judas was a person. It humanizes him. It really does. And I don't mean in a super sympathetic, oh, poor Judas, but partly, yeah. He was human. He was fallible. Scripture does say that he didn't intend... Well, let me, let me be careful with my words. Scripture does say that he regretted what happened. He regretted doing what he did, which we can infer that means he didn't want crucifixion. So why did Judas do what he did? Well, you know, a lot of theories out there pushing, um, forcing Jesus' hand, things like that. But we do know, bottom line, Scripture tells us that he was remorseful. So this painting and the title is, is the starting point for that. The act of betrayal is done. Now the seeds, the root, are there for 
the conscience to take hold and say, Judas, what have you done? Now, how Judas responds to that is not favorably, and his journey ends um, tragically. But the artist, you look at a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of Last Supper, a lot of Garden, Gethsemane, a lot of rest art, and a lot of them, a lot of them, my goodness, the way they depict Judas, like his, you know, they'll, they'll all, all the all the disciples will be like a hero, like Buzz Lightyear with a face, and then there'll be Judas all like, you know, looking like a troll almost. They, they dehumanize him to make him seem so much more villainry, much more like a villain, and we forget that he was a human just like we were. He took things into his own hands just like we do. He tried to take control just like we do. And we forget that this is one of Jesus' closest friends, closest loved ones. He is right there at the inner circle. When Jesus says at the Last Supper, one of you going to betray me, they didn't all point and say, it's going to be Judas, right? Because he's, you know, he's a little, a little shady. No, they, they actually, they asked, is it me? Am I going to do it? Is it going to be me that's going to fail? So he was just like the rest of them. And this depicts that, that he made a massive mistake. Okay, so there's that. And again, shrouded in darkness, but not in a demonic, evil way, in a human. He's left now with his conscience for what he did. You know, it's, it's light and it's dark. It's thematic light and dark, but not oppressively so. It's a, and when we know the story of Judas, it's a very ouch type of moment. It's sad. It is. The story of Judas is sad and tragic. And Nikolai Guy, um, this, this moment from, this painting from 1891, which uh, is located in a gallery in Moscow, in Russia. I'm not going to try to pronounce the name. Wonderful. Um, wonderful piece. So, that's going to be the last piece that we're going to look at. So we looked at a few images of Jesus. Daniel Bonnell, the woman at the well. Um, I'm not going to hold them back up because we've gone for a while now. Um, we, we looked at a few images of Jesus. We looked at the prodigal son and we looked at Judas. How are they all tied together? They're not. They're just awesome pieces that give us awesome things to talk about. And we can respond to them emotionally and spiritually perhaps. So... I want to thank you for stopping by the channel. I, I hope maybe you enjoy this. I If I do this again, I will try not to make it a 45-minute thing. Um, this was a first for me. I haven't done it in a while. I obviously had a lot to say, so I will navigate that better. But enough of me dancing around an apology that I probably don't have to make. Thank you for stopping by. I do appreciate it. I appreciate you checking out the channel and the video. I hope that this video... Um, in some way, shape, or form, nourish your soul as we connect with themes, topics, conversations that maybe we can find fruit in, or maybe that we did find fruit in. I want to wish you peace and joy and healing and comfort and goodness and guidance in whatever it is that you need in your journey going forward. I pray that God guides you, that you find light, that you find joy, that you find love for yourself, for each other. Thank you again for stopping by the channel. Peace to you. I love you all. God bless you. Have a great day. Have a great week. Ciao.